This is your Barbados Today Evening News Update for Thursday, March 10. One man was killed and another injured in two separate shooting incidents in St. Michael today. At 7th Avenue, New Orleans, 56-year-old Merton Patrick Hines was shot in his chest and back around 9.30 this morning. Police Public Relations Officer Acting Inspector Rodney Innes later reported that Hines had succumbed to his injuries while receiving treatment at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. In the second incident, 23-year-old Arashkas Grant suffered injuries after being shot in a drive-by shooting between Waterhall Land and Hill Road. Inspector Innes said that a motorcyclist with a pillion rider drove through the area and discharged several gunshots just after 10 o'clock. Innes revealed that Grant was transported to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital by ambulance for medical treatment. Police are continuing investigations into both incidents. Monday is Budget Day in Barbados and Prime Minister Mia Motley is ready to deliver the 2022 financial and economic statement. The budget is expected to paint a clear picture on how government intends to address critical economic and social matters over the next year. It would also outline the actions government will take to spur economic growth, generally create jobs and rejuvenate critical traditional sectors, while incentivizing emerging industries in such areas as renewable energy and the blue economy. A young homeless couple will be off the streets tonight. Word of this from President of the Barbados Alliance to End Homelessness as he intervened to assist 19-year-old Amaritis Griffith and her 22-year-old boyfriend Enrique Marshall, who have been living in Hero Square for the past two years. At a news conference today, Safri disclosed that he has been in contact with both parents of the young couple and it was safe for them to return home. He said that Marshall has agreed to return to his mother's house, but Gettings, who told Barbados today she was being abused, has some issues that are still to be resolved. The young man, I just came out of a two and a half hour meeting with his mother, with her, um, the young lady's mother as well. I was in a meeting with both of them, and they both were present for that meeting. And we discussed a number of things. Yes, the young fella, the young fella he can go right back home. His mother said, I never put up my child, and my child can come back home at any point of time. In the young lady's case, we've heard that um, based on what is being transpired in the media, that she's in her home, she's sexually assaulted. Now, this is obviously a ticklish case, but when we've dug up as much as we can, we try to reach out. Uh, we've spoken with the mother, we've spoken with other family relatives, um, we are hearing a different side of the story. Safri also responded to criticism surrounding his response in the story first reported by Barbados today. He had described the couple's relationship as puppy love, but today he explained that the two young people were offered a range of services, including shelter at the BAEH building in Bridgetown, but opted not to accept housing because they could not sleep together. I must say, I was not involved in the interview, nor was I involved in the article. I was asked a question, not knowing that there was an interview that was done before. And I gave my comment. And my comments were that this is, yes, puppy love that they have. Not disrespecting anyone or degrading anyone. Because all puppy love speaks to is the first kind of romantic affection you have as young people, as teenagers, you feel it. I've had puppy love. There's nothing degrading about the comment that I see people are wasting time on rather than waste, than spending time on helping these young people. You're not trying to disrespect the love that they have for each other. That's, that's, that's folly. We will never stop anybody from having affection, whether or not they're mental health, child, mentally challenged, or whether or not they're homeless. We all have our feelings. We all have our affection. So I think that when we are wrapped up in rather Safri say puppy love, which is a teenage affection that um, in the dictionary, and um, it's folly. In other news this Thursday, experts at the Caribbean Centre for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, CCREEE, says the region must speed up its switch from fossil fuel to renewable energy. Charlene Bowden, Sustainable Energy Development 
and gender expert with CCREEE is concerned that government is not paying enough attention to the critical move. And he suggests that while decision makers have to juggle a lot of things with tight resources, they must act to protect citizens from the severe impact of rising fuel prices. From a government standpoint, there are a lot of nuances that exist. And, and with that, I also want to say that the regulatory framework in our member states do not always support that transition. It doesn't support the average person like you and me to be able to invest in renewable energy. Um, so I, I will take country X, for example, uh, country in the OECS, um, for a commercial agency, um, the limit is really installing 25, and I really hope that there's some context here that you can understand. The limit is is, is installing a system only up to 25 kilowatts. I'm going to take a small hotel. That, that really is a drop in the bucket for a small hotel. Bowling cautioned that government could end up in hot water if a significant event is to stop fuel imports from occurring. Because our government, our, our national budget of income and revenue on the national level is so dependent upon taxes that are tied into the imports of vehicles, mm. how then do we convince our government or what argument do we present to our government to say, yes, you will forfeit quite a bit of revenue if you no longer allow or you support purely electric vehicles um, coming in. Because remember, a lot of these taxes that tied into the fuel. So there are a lot of things to think about. I'm saying that to say, um, I think what we need to do is find solutions for the problems rather than problems for our solutions. But there are nuances that we must be aware of. There's regional and international news after this short break. More oxygen means more energy means more adventure. Cure Oxygen, natural spring water infused with more oxygen to improve your energy, immunity and performance. The next generation of hydration. Cure Oxygen, nature's ultimate water. Caribbean Cool is a refreshing juice drink that contains 100% vitamin C that you can enjoy any time of the day. It has a refreshingly awesome range of Caribbean flavors. Morbi, orange, fruit punch, pineapple, sorrel, and pineapple coconut. Suitable for any occasion. Caribbean Cool. To regional happenings, President of the St. Vincent and Grenadines Teachers Unions, Oswell Robinson, continues to blast the government's vaccination policy. Several teachers and other public sector workers have lost their jobs and accrued benefits for failing to take the COVID-19 vaccine. The SVTU president described the vaccination policy as a wicked act. More on their support from SVG TV. So we are calling on the government, as we have done consistently in terms of our effective representation of our workers in, and in particular now teachers who are so direly need in the classroom because our children are suffering. Many schools do not have adequate quality teachers and we know CXC will begin in a month or two, in the month of May. Many students in the classroom cannot and have not yet started to do the SBA. What has, has done is to hold our students at ransom and firing quality teachers. A lot of Form 5 teachers have been out of job and those are the persons who have the responsibility to, to prepare the students. They have the experience, the knowledge, the expertise in preparing our students adequately for the external exams. And it is very, very sad that a government and the Ministry of Education has been involved in this wicked... On the international front, the Russian-Ukraine ceasefire talks have stalled. The Ukrainian foreign minister said no progress was made on reaching a solution during talks with his Russian counterpart, Sever Lavorko, in Turkey. We get the details from Reuters TV. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba said no progress was made on achieving a ceasefire in Ukraine in talks with his Russian counterpart Sergei Lavrov on Thursday. Hosted by Turkey, they were the first high-level talks between the two countries since Moscow invaded its neighbour. 
Kuleba told reporters the most critical situation was in the southern port of Mariupol, but that Lavrov did not commit to a humanitarian corridor there. I want to confirm once again that Ukraine did not surrender, is not surrendering, and will not surrender. We are ready for diplomacy. We are looking for diplomatic solutions. But while there are no such solutions, we will be dedicated. By sacrificing ourselves to defend our land, our people from Russian aggression. Well, that's news, but for the very latest, you can visit us at www.barbaristoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook. And sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media and Bus Terminals, as well as Screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. You can also hear us on Capital Media HD, 99.3 FM.